massive ducks in a row. Um, something a little bit fun, a little bit cool, a little bit interesting. Um, yeah, ducks, ducks in a row. Um, the, this message really initiated from my time that I've been spending in the park with my son feeding ducks. That is what is how it originated. Um, and obviously being in like a quarantine in the house with your son, there's not too many things you can do in a house besides going to a park and being isolated and feeding ducks, which my son loves at the moment, ducks. Uh, in fact, if my son sees a duck, he will be saying duck, duck, duck for the next five to ten seconds. Um, and he loves ducks. He just loves, loves ducks. The, the only problem that uh, this generation has fed the idea that all ducks are yellow. And when you go to feed a duck, they are beyond yellow. They are brown and dark and beyond yellow. And Zion spends half the time feeding the duck but looks at me and says, like, duck? But then once they start quacking, he, he really gets the idea that it is a duck. But um, it's funny. In, in fact, in, in our home as of late, we have a, a, a weekly tradition, if not every several days, that we'll go to the, to the park down the road to feed the duck. And uh, I'll take a couple pieces of bread, cut it up all in little squares. Uh, as my wife has taught me well, put it in a Ziploc bag and Zion will hold it and, and just throw bread, um, which is amazing. And he loves it. And in the park, you'll get ducks, birds, uh, pelicans, everything like that. He just loves the wildlife of animals and, and feeding the ducks. And that is what my life has consisted of the past couple weeks, ducks, feeding ducks. But in the midst of our new tradition of feeding and observing ducks, I couldn't help but notice how perfect and aligned little ducks are to their mothers. Has anyone noticed how, how little ducks will follow their mother? And there's a terminology in the English terminology that it originates from that is ducks in a row. And beyond that, as I was following all these little ducks that followed their mothers, and, and it doesn't matter whether they were walking or swimming, they will follow their, their mothers. If you can put the photo on, it helps explain for those who don't, so don't understand that ducks will follow their mother. And as I looked it up during the whole like National Geographic thing this week, uh, statistically, facts say that when ducklings are very young, they struggle to get through heavy vegetation, hence forming a single line, as they do. But beyond that, they generally will follow their mother in a single file because her movement through the area pushes any foliage aside and helps create a path for her ducklings to follow. But wait, there's more. Ducklings rely on their mothers for a water-repelling oil on their feathers during the first four to six weeks of their lives. And they begin to grow their real feathers at about four weeks of age. And the oil producing gland at the end of their spine begins to produce oil at around the same time. But ducklings without a mother duck will most probably die if they do get in water during those first few weeks of their life. Interesting, isn't it? Hence why ducks form a line following their mother. Who would love their children to be that obedient to them? That they followed them in a single straight line? But this is why little ducklings form a straight line and follow their mother. And, and this is what I've had the joy of observing for so many times this week, is little ducks, whether on land or water, will follow their mother in a single line. But the English terminology, as we know as ducks in a row, means to be well prepared or well organized for something that is about to happen. It is a certain level of preparation or alignment to have an order for something that you were expecting. That's why when someone will say you need to have your ducks in a row, it means that you better get your life in order. You better get things in order for what is about to take place. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Matthew 25 verse 21, the parable of the talents. And in verse 25 and verse 21, it says this, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant, or steward as some translations say. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. I love that. You've been faithful with little, so I will put you in charge of many. See, there is something so powerful that takes place in our life when we learn to steward well what God has given us. There is something powerful that takes place when we learn to steward exactly what God has placed in our hand. In, our hand. in fact, whether you've been in church for a couple of weeks or several years, you, you probably would have heard that if you want God to use you in greater ways, you learn to show God that you can handle what you've been given now. Learn to show God that you are a good steward of what He has placed in your hand. And that's where the terminology ducks in a row comes from, 
to have everything in order. That for something that is about to take place, for something that you're expecting, you better get your ducks in order that you get things in alignment with what God is going to do. See, the parable of the talents in the book of Matthew 25, if you have your Bible, uh, you can open it, or if you have your Bible, you can turn it on. Uh, Matthew 25 talks about the parable of the talents. And in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents is probably one of the most overused or abused texts in the New Testament that everyone uses. And I'll say to it like this, that contrary to what might be said, some of the best-selling tele-evangelists will use this parable of the talents to try propel gospel prosperity. But instead, this, this parable of the talents challenges believers to imitate the master by using all that God has given them for the sake of the kingdom as a good steward. And it's amazing that when we talk about stewarding, too often we can think of money or just more materialistic things to steward rather than thinking kingdom-minded that God wants you to steward well for what he's about to do in your life. It's so often that we want to dream big or we have big expectations, big dreams for our life and our future, yet we're not stewarding what God has already given. But in Matthew 25 from verse 14, this is from the Holman translation, says this, and I hope you don't mind reading the Bible. This is a little bit of a big paraphrase. But it says this in verse 14, For it is just like a man going on a journey. He caught his own slaves and turned over his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more, and the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and laid his master's money aside. And I'll stop there. It's amazing that this man gave three different people different amounts of money or different talents, yet all three of them did something completely different, or maybe one of them did something different. But it's amazing that when you read this story of the parable of the talents, so many people can begin to be frustrated from the start of reading this passage, thinking, why would God give one person five, another person two, and another person one? How does that justify God? In fact, how unfair could our God be that He would not give an even dispersion of financial money to these people? How unfair could God be? But it's funny that in our walk in life, we're always looking at the comparison of what God can give. We're always looking at the comparison of, of, but God gave them this, but God gave them that. Why, Why didn't God give me this? Or why didn't God provide me for healing now? Or why did they receive an abundance then? Why did they receive breakthrough and I'm still plowing my way? See, how they started or or maybe what financial position they were in, how, how they were set up in life, there is always a need for comparison. And it doesn't just happen in the Christian world, it happens outside. It, it is a natural form that we always use comparison as a tool. But I love verse 15 of Matthew And it reminds us, and it says this, God gave to each according to his own ability. I love that. God gave each according to his own ability. In fact, if you have what you have, that's because it's what you can handle. Or beyond that, if you want more, learn to steward what God has given you. I thank God that the pressures that I handle now at 28 years of age, in fact, the pressures of of being a parent, is not a nine to four job, it's the 24 seven thing. But the pressures that I handle now in ministry and work and life and marriage, I thank God I didn't have to go through them at 24. I thank God I didn't have to go through them at 20 when I was just married. But it was a journey, learning to steward well what God has given, learning to steward what God has given, knowing that I didn't want to just have more, but I wanted God to give me more responsibility. See, stewardship says today matters. That's what stewardship says. Today matters. But beyond that, what today brought into your life was a product of what you sowed yesterday. Stewardship stewardship says today matters. That God, what you gave me, what you placed in my hand matters to me. And although it's not my destination or my goal, it matters to me. And if it matters to you, God, it matters to me. See, 
when we tithe, when we give offerings or tithes and offerings, we do not give to God to simply gain. In fact, I remember being a little boy in church, and, and, and I remember my parents teach, teaching me the parable of giving. And, and I remember them saying, hey, hey, like, you know, give unto God because give 10%, give unto God. It shows that God is, is your number one, that God wants your heart, not the amount. And, and I remember thinking as a little boy that, okay, so if I give 10, I'll get 10 back, right? Or like, if I give 10, I'll get 20. Or, or, or then you hear a cool story of someone who gave their, their last like $10 in their amount, and that night they had someone who, give, who gave them 100. And it was like, okay, God, if I give this, you'll double my money here. In fact, for even in our life, that there's been instances where we gave the last bit of money in our bank account, and yet we had someone pay for our dinner after the service. But you don't give to gain. But that's what I love. We do not give to simply gain. We give to God to be entrusted with more. Tithing was never a money thing. It was a heart thing. God just used money as a tool to get to your heart because he knows that we hold money so close to our heart. Because we do not give to God to simply gain. We give to God to be entrusted with more. I want to encourage you that our giving, our time, our service, God doesn't want to just prosper you, but He wants to entrust you with more. Because God knows if He can entrust you with the little, He'll give you more. Following on from verse 19 of Matthew 25, says this, After a long time, as the Master comes back, after He gave these three men those, the money, verse 19 says this, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents and said, Master, you gave me five talents. Look, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Verse 22 says, And the man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. Look, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful over a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Verse 24 then goes on to say, The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a difficult man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. Look, have what is yours. In verse 26, the master replied to him, You evil, lazy slave. I know that's pretty abrupt, isn't it? You evil, lazy slave. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gathered where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers. And when I returned, I would have received my money back with interest. Verse 28 says, So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. Verse 29 says, For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who doesn't have even what he has will be taken away from him. I know it, it, it's a pretty crazy concept to realize that God didn't evilly disperse what was given. But beyond that, that for the person to go and hide what God had given or this man had given was the wrong concept. That God didn't want to just grow his money. God wanted to see this person do something with it. He wanted to see that they were going to be a good steward not afraid of what God had given. Because I believe that when God appoints you, when God calls you, it's amazing that when God gives you a dream or a vision, how often do we become scared or timid? I could pretty much almost guarantee whatever dream or vision I've had to pray or, or just do something God has done, my first reaction is to be scared. But God, are you asking the right person? But God, are you sure you're talking to the right man? But God, there are so many other greater people with a greater voice, a greater strength, a greater everything else. Are you sure you're talking to the right person? And how often when God gives something, He isn't looking for your availability. He just wants you to be a good steward, that you would be available. That's what God wants. Tonight, I really felt pressed in my heart the power of stewardship to not only allow us to evaluate our mindset and our ambitions, but to refocus our goals for kingdom. I'm not here tonight to judge and say, hey, you know what? You need to reevaluate. You need to do this, 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 this. These are the four steps you need to do to get an order. But I want to bring a greater awareness for us to reevaluate our life on stewarding. How are we stewarding what God has given? 
In fact, how are we stewarding where God has placed us? In fact, how are we stewarding where we are just in our church? Do we come to take or do we come to give? Do we come to just impart or do we come to just sit? In our week, how do we go about in our week when, when, when God's asked us to do something, are we taking hold of which what God has given us? Because it's so easy that we ask God for more. But when God calls us out, God just wants to call what's in your hand. That's it. When God calls upon you, He doesn't want to call your future you. He wants to call your current you. He wants to call you as you are. It's amazing that when, when God called us out of sin, when we gave our heart to God, God didn't call us from where we were from, or to where we're going. God called us to where we were. He didn't say, I want to subtract or take out. He said, come to me as you are. And as you come to me as you are, I will use you for a greater purpose, for a greater life. But if I were to ask the question, what does stewardship look like in our lives today? Unfortunately, as I was saying earlier, many Christians today only associate the word of stewardship with money. Or maybe sermons they've heard about budgets or building programs. That is what we classify as stewarding. But money would be the greatest thing. And, and I've got a couple points here tonight to just reiterate the power of, of good stewardship, kingdom stewardship. And number one is this. Learn to steward what God has already entrusted. Or as I said in the sermon, get your ducks in a row. Begin to prepare and organize what God has already given you. If God has just asked you to serve wherever you are, just serve where you are. Find joy in serving. I know too often we can find, find the joy fulfillment of wanting to move ahead, but find joy in where you are. Find, find the joy where God has placed you in the season you're in. Nothing you do is permanent. Everything you do is for a season, and this is the season you are in. But beyond that, as I was saying, find joy in the present of serving and just being where God has placed you. It's amazing that even in my life, in, in our life, there's been seasons where we didn't enjoy or seasons where we thought, God, I feel there is something more. Or there are seasons where, God, I just feel like I don't want to stay here too much longer. Or maybe this pain that I'm going through, this struggle that I'm going through, just this iniquity we've been going through, God, I don't want to stay here much longer. Learn to find joy, which is Jesus, and learn to steward what God has given you. Maybe if you're single, it, 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 it's amazing that I remember when I was single, I used to think, man, I can't, I look forward to the day when, when I am married. But maybe if you're single, find the joy of just being single, having the time and financial position to be God's hands and feet. It's amazing that I used to think being a parent would be like, okay, it won't be that crazy. But being a parent is pretty crazy because it's not a nine to four job. In fact, try having a, a son who is sick or, or, or something like that. But if you're single, find joy of being single and find enjoyment in the season you're in. If you're a young person, find joy in the season of being a young person. Find the joy of where God has placed you and learn to steward that well, knowing that in your stewarding, God will give you a greater responsibility. God doesn't just want to raise your bank account. He wants to entrust you with more. See, in order for you to go from this season to the next depends on your preparation and organization to steward where God has placed you right here and now. Could the keyboardist come up? And I love this saying, your next season of ability is 100% dependent on the last season of responsibility. Your next season of ability is 100% dependent on your last season of responsibility. How were you stewarding where God placed you? How were you stewarding what God gave you? How were you stewarding where God placed you? How were you a good steward that God could enrich you, not just your bank account, but how could God entrust you with more? See, as I was saying earlier, we do not give to God to simply gain. We give to God to be entrusted with more. Please don't tithe $100 tonight to double your money, as I said earlier, but instead tithe so God could trust you as a good steward that I would be trustworthy and trusting with what God has for me in this season and for the next. I think all of us as Christian believers long for that word, well done, good and faithful servant. 
or well done, good and faithful steward. It doesn't matter how much earthly material we acquire on earth. The day we go to glory, we will never take that with us. But the day that my time comes to go to glory, I love to hear the words, well done, good and faithful steward. That no matter what I gave you, you stewarded so well, so I gave you more. That if I could trust you with a handful of five kids, I could give you 10. That if I could give you 20, I could give you 50. I remember, I think this is our fifth year being the youth pastors in the church. And I remember when we took over the youth ministry, it wasn't in this great hype of taking it over. It was sort of in this rebuilding and and really rebuilding everything. But I thank God that God could entrust me as a steward over 10 kids, that He could entrust us over more. That that in our entrusting of running out an event of 400 plus kids that next year, we're running an event to be doubling that, those numbers later this year. That's not just an event for us, but an event over our city of Logan. I thank God that, that what God has given me, that I serve where He's placed me, knowing that, God, I'm not doing this for gain, but I'm doing this so that You could entrust me with more. Point number two is this. A stewarding mentality reflects kingdom, not ownership. A stewarding mentality reflects kingdom, not ownership. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. It's crazy that my marriage, my son, everything that I have, everything that I I strive to be belongs to the Lord. In fact, my son was the Lord's before he was ever mine. I'm just the steward that God would entrust me to raise up this child. It's important to realize in the kingdom of God, we are all just stewards. We don't own a thing. We're just stewards on earth whom are sons and daughters equipped to carry the presence and power of God. Everything that you do in the season you're in, your business, your finances, your bank account, your job, your career, your, your children, you don't own. You're just a steward. So why do we have an ownership mentality? C.S. Lewis said this, and I love it. It says, Every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. And if you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to God's service, you could not give Him anything that was not in a sense His own already. Everything that you have, everything that you are already belongs to God. That that the day you gave your heart to God was a commitment to God to say, God, it's your life, not my own. In fact, I thank God that we serve a God of abundance because God wants to bless His stewards. And point number three is this. Stewardship is the ability to take care of something that isn't yours. Stewardship is the ability to take care of something that isn't yours. A couple of questions that we should continually ask ourselves, and, and me even preparing this message made me ask myself these questions. What have you been doing with what God has given? I'm not saying what you want God to give, but what have you been doing with what God has currently given you in your hand today? Or beyond that, how are you handling with what God has placed in your hands? Is it your children, your job? Maybe the way you serve in this church? Maybe you're greeted at the cafe? Maybe you're on armor bearers? Maybe you're on the offering team? Maybe whatever your role is, Whatever position, whatever job, whatever relationship that is in your hand, how are you stewarding what God has placed in your hand? Because too often, if we don't have a kingdom mentality, when God gives us something to do or to hold on to, we hold on to it so tight we don't want to let go. But God's there saying, do you not realize I have something more for you? I have something greater for you. I didn't give this to you to hold on to. I gave this to you to go from a greater strength to a greater position to steward something greater. But too often when God gives us something, we don't want to let go because we become comfortable. But God just says, I want you to have a kingdom mentality, not an ownership mentality. Too often people quote, but God, if only I had this, or maybe if only I made this much, or God, but you don't understand the situation I'm in. But God only ever asks for what is currently in your hand. 
As I said earlier, when, when you gave your heart to God, a sinner broken and ashamed, God took you as you were. Nothing added, nothing subtracted, just as you were. And I'll repeat what Matthew 25, 21 says, and then the whole band could come out. It's Matthew 25, 21, and I loved it. It said, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. For you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Get your ducks in a row. Ducks are cute. Ducks are ambitious. But there is something powerful and there is something illustrated by something so small. That it's amazing in, in our journey called life, we should always have a duckling mentality that God, where you go, I will go. Where you lead, I will follow. But how often when we get saved, when we do life, we have that duckling mentality, God, where you go, I will go. Where, wherever you tell me to go, I will follow. And as those ducklings follow their mother, not just for safety, but for nurturing through troubled waters, they cling close to their mother for safety, not just to stay where they are, but as they go through life, they want to be safe and secure. And how often is that relationship with God? But I love that. How often do we need to recess our life and say, hey, as I did this week, are my ducks in order? As the English terminology for ducks in a row means to be well prepared or well organized for something that is about to take place. If you are stewarding something and if you are a Christian believer, then I'm afraid to tell you, you are already stewarding something. If you call Jesus your Father and you are a Christian, you are already a steward. So the question you should ask yourself is, am I stewarding this well? And if God hasn't given me something physically to steward around people, am I stewarding my Christian life well? And the Christian life is never something to point out or say, hey, this, 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 this. I love the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will point it out and reveal it to your heart, to you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need the person on your, on your left, to your right. He doesn't even need your partner or your spouse. But the God will speak to you in His own gentle way. Say, are your ducks in order? Are you preparing? Are you ready for what I'm about to do? because you don't realize that I just want you to steward what I gave you, not to hold on to, but to steward so I could give you something else. You don't realize that, 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 that your point of giving and sowing into the church, into my kingdom, was to never for, for your gain or, or, for, or for you to never have a new house or better clothes or a new phone. You stewarding was so that I could entrust you with more. In fact, your tithes and your offerings was never about a money thing. It was about a heart thing. That if I could trust you with this, what could I trust you with? In fact, that if I could trust you with this person, what could I entrust you in a relationship? But in the season you're in, learn to steward well. Learn to steward well. If you're a young person, steward your youth. If you're single, steward your singleness. In your marriage, steward your marriage. Steward what God has given you because it's a season. 